Kia ora, ni hao, and hello. Welcome to the Chewy Journal podcast. I'm your host, Camille Yang. My guest today is Pedro Oliveira. Pedro is the co-founder and CEO of Thailand Protocol, a web-free professional platform where builders and creators can create their own on-chain resumes and find the meaningful connections and support they need to succeed. I met Pedro in person when I moved to Lisbon and participated in many Web3 related events and conferences organized by him and his company. In today's episode, we discussed Talent Protocol, why Lisbon became a Web3 hub in Europe, and HR ad technologies. I hope you enjoy the show. I'm uh, super excited to dive into the intersection of Web3, HR, and talent with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me on the podcast. It's a pleasure. We've known each other for, for a while now. And, um, you know, just being able to contribute, um, absolute pleasure. Let's start with some fun questions. If you had a chance to recruit some superheroes from the Marvel or DC universe for your Web3 startup, which heroes would you choose for some key roles like um, lead developer or community manager and why? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I would say immediately the first character, uh, superhero that, that came to, to mind was uh, Iron Man. You know, mostly because behind the character, there's a scientist and um, with a lot of character. Which which I like, so I I would go with the, the my first emotional pick. Mm-hmm. Let's like this. My 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 gut gut pick was yeah. was that one. So I'll stick with my my guns. Yeah, he will be very powerful. I think for him alone, he can operate the whole company <laughs> very well. For sure, for yeah. sure, or multiple companies at the same time, more like. Yeah, I know there are so many people very skeptical about Web three. Could you explain the concept of Web3 and uh, how your company, Talent Protocol, fits into this uh, new paradigm of uh, decentralized technologies? Yeah, I think, I think the skepticism comes from the fact that uh, crypto or Web3 has been packed with, with a lot of trading mindset. You know? Who likes Wall Street, right? So it's kind of like the same sentiment but towards a different uh, demography. So I, I kind of understand the negative vibes uh, about uh, Web3, but you, you got to really understand the technology um, to, to understand you know, what's dri- the driving force behind it. That's blockchain. And uh, blockchain uh, solves this uh, super uh, old uh, issue, which is the uh, Byzantine uh, generals uh, problem where the Byzantine generals would work to solve, to, to save the Byzantine empire, but they wouldn't trust each other. <laughs> and that's a problem because then the empire wasn't saved. I mean, at some point it ended, but um, it was always an unsolved problem until uh, blockchain came in uh, and created through technology a way for people to trust each other. Uh, based on a distributed system, uh, you know, private keys, public keys. My background is computer science, so it's it's not something that is super new for me. Um, but the technology itself, from from my perspective, is fascinating. The uh, bringing in these distributed systems with with economy uh, concepts. It's just uh, and and there's this mysticism. We were talking about super superheroes before. There's this mystic behind it uh, with uh, you know the first. Uh, uh, paper on, on Bitcoin, um, yeah. peer-to-peer uh, Bitcoin, which was like, uh, who, who did it? Nobody really knows. Uh, there's this mystic behind it that I mm-hmm. think kind of fuels the whole thing in a way, some people at least. But uh, I think it's uh, to answer your question, like uh, we, we've we had different evolution waves uh, for the web, for yeah. the internet as we know it. The, the first one uh, was a slow internet not not many people had access to it the sites were very clunky the utility was limited okay uh, but still was still great you know and then we had a second wave where we could call it web 2 where the utility was there you know whether it was gaming whether it was e-commerce uh, whether it was social it was just there and i think web 3 is the evolution of that um by decentralizing the the, the powers of 
the, the, the previous two uh, internet uh, evolutions. And um, I think with uh, with Web3, we're still in the very early days. We're still figuring out utility. Yes. But I think it makes, uh, um, not only is an evolution of, of the internet, but I think it's an evolution of society. We, both me and you, we, we have been exposed to Western cultures and uh, currencies that are more or less stable, uh, stable currencies, even though you travel a lot more than I do. But I'm more based in Europe, in, in Lisbon in specific. And uh, we, we are kind of privileged. Mm -hmm. we, we got a currency that is uh, more or less stable. But, you know, I, I deal with uh, people from all over the world, uh, especially South America, Africa, Asia, through Talent Protocol, where their uh, regional um, context is very different. Uh, they, they don't fully trust institutions that govern themselves mm -hmm. that govern them and and much less the financial institutions as well so and then web3 uh, is a transformation not only of the internet but uh, of society in, in general for them the utility is clear because web3 is not an opportunity it's a need on the day-to-day -day basis so yeah i think i think uh, with talent protocol we're, we're trying to support talent anywhere uh, we're trying to help talent succeed and, and, and find uh, fulfillment, find their purpose uh, in life, especially those building in, in Web3. And we have multiple ways we've been doing this. One of them you've been part of, yeah. which is the, the, the Townhouse yeah. Scholarship Program, where we bring people from uh, all over the world to, to attend their first Web3 hackathon or conference mm -hmm. and, and just understand more about uh, uh, this um, ecosystem and, you know, bring opportunities to, to them. I think we've done a good job at it. Uh, we've brought uh, yeah. dozens of people. Obviously, we're sponsored by amazing uh, partners like Protocol Labs and Cello that allows us to, to have this program. And, and we've been able to do it. And um, it's a good way to support our mission. Keep in mind that whatever I told you about Talent Protocol, I didn't mention blockchain. Because when you're building... Imagine you were building Uber or something like that. You wouldn't say, oh, we're building a Web2 app. No, you're building an app to call a taxi yeah. driver or, or a substitute of a taxi driver. I'm not telling you we're doing a blockchain app or something. Blockchain is involved because the things we do with talent, they go on-chain. So we have this, we're working on reputational on-chain. But keep in mind, when I did the pitch, I didn't mention blockchain because, and I think that's the way to go. I mean, it's a natural evolution. And when you realize it, yeah, it's supported by blockchain, but yeah. awesome. I mean, and, and that's when, you know, we're there mm -hmm. and we're not there yet. Yeah. I know your background is in computer science. I see a lot of uh, tech people. They're not that interested in HR or talent. So yeah. what, what motivates you to built this project and what's your passion from like caring about people and caring about talent? You know, part of it is the way I am. Part of it was luck. It just happened. Mm -hmm. um, I think many careers have, have this, uh, you know, luck component or, or random component, which is fine. And I just, just embrace that. The, the fact is, this is my uh, talent protocol is my fourth uh, startup. And uh, the four that I've created so far, mm -hmm. three of them were in the HR technology space. So is that a coincidence? Probably not. So my understanding is that um, I've always been a, a people person. I think uh, that, well, I, I, obviously I love technology. I think that's kind of the baseline for uh, everything I've done with, with my life. But I think um, it wasn't like I woke up one day and, oh, here's my purpose. I think I just step by step, started to understand oh this is actually uh something that really works for me really triggers me in a positive way which is building products which is something i love not only like the technological part but the product itself you know finding the fit between um you know product and market uh, fit that's that's what uh, drives my my energy up but from a purpose perspective that's when i started to realize Damn, I really enjoy uh, long term when I help people be more productive at work or find their purpose in, in life. So it doesn't sound bad if I dedicate myself to that. Plus, it, it's not a narrow perspective. It gives a lot of space on things to, to build, things like talent protocol, 
like um, I was doing a sabbatical, which I recommend if you anyone listening, if you have the chance, if you have the privilege and the opportunity to do that, I think it's a fundamental moment in your life to take a step back and enter, go from focus mode to diffuse mode and allow your brain to just explore things you wouldn't explore um, in a normal mm-hmm. setting. Um, and before I started Talent Post Gold, it's, it's what I did. But anyway, to answer your question, it kind of happened randomly, but I started to understand uh, gradually this makes sense for me. It's what I enjoy. So I'm going to double down on it. And I, I would do this every time. And here we are. Maybe I'll change my mind in, in the future. But I remain confident um, that at least for the next five to 10 years, this is the space that I feel I can uh, contribute. Yeah. You know, at the uh the development of AI, such a buzzword now. And a lot of people say, oh, AI will replace our jobs and there's going to be a huge unemployment rate raising up. So what's your opinion about that compare AI with a human being, human resources? I think history tends to repeat itself just with different flavors or different sounds. If you want to have a more musical approach to to the the phrase, I think this has happened before. Just the pace is so much faster, and yeah. we are more as humans, we are more interconnected than ever. So it just seems chaotic and faster because we are exposed to a lot more information. But this has happened before mm-hmm. in the industrial revolution, in the internet ev- revolution. It's just one more. I'm using it every day uh, to make my my again. It's all about utility. I'm using it every day. AI is not something new. Artificial intelligence is a, a decades uh, uh, discipline. Uh, I mean, over since even before the Second World War, so it's almost a century that the discipline exists. It's just that now we kind of have the balance where we have nice experiments crossed with uh, the, the the good models, uh, with machine learning models, and um, with you know, pretty interesting data set. So I think we, we reached a point where the utility just emerged. And honestly, I think some of the jobs that got axed, like let's say a translator or something like that, or simple translator, I think those jobs were already being axed away. I think like, I know you translated a book from, from <laughs> Jordan Peterson, uh, Jordan Peterson yeah. but I think that that involves it, that job if if it if you were to do it again oh. now i think you could embrace uh, uh ai whatever the, the tech was yeah. open ai or or other and do it in a more productive way and have more more effectiveness i don't think it re- removes the human uh from the equation i just think we some humans will embrace this new tech some others will be left behind for me i love it i think it's gonna help pe- again Going back to my purpose in, in, in this life, helping people be more productive at work, <laughs> AI. The the way we know it now that is very visible and present in our life, it's it's, right, it's, it's just that. So I'm using it every day. My my wife, she's a developer. She's using it every day as well. So very happy with, with uh, where we're going with this. Not worried. Uh, again, keep in mind, um, uh, generative uh, AI is, is very different from AGI. That's the next level. We're not there yet. But again, it does drive other questions, especially around, you know, what if we have uh, we reach a point where some uh, uh, jobs, you know, or a lot of jobs won't need human work or human, mm-hmm. uh, when I say human work, not, not just muscle work, but brain work as well. Yeah. Uh, are, is our society ready for that? I don't think it is. And I think ours, uh, we need a new social, I was going to say social smart contract, but just social contract uh, that uh, allows people to, you know, uh, I don't like the, the term UBI uh, because it's very, it reduces humans to, to basic income. It's like, it's only thinking about income. I'm thinking more about, it's not a positive mm-hmm. term in my, my opinion. It's more about it should be one day we'll eventually I'll I'll, I'll be blunt uh, uh, about this. I think one day we'll live in a society where being unemployed is um, mm. is cool. 
you know, like it's almost like uh, taking a sabbatical is actually quite good. Oh, oh you're taking a, uh, you're an employee. Awesome. I mean, what are you going to learn next? You know, like, uh, have you been having, have you uh, have fun? Where did you go last three months? It just become different. I don't think we're ready uh, mm. for that. Uh, I think our society is too revenue driven and it needs to be more uh, ownership and, and, and revenue or a mix of, of those two. But anyway, it's just a very strong, a uh, very long <laughs> uh, philosophical conversation to to have. But all in all, to answer your question, AI, bring it on. Let's do this. Uh, it helps us be more productive at work. I'm very excited. Uh, I recently listened to a podcast. Kevin Kelly is on Team Ferris podcast. And they talk about AI won't replace human, but just to, to finish the task. Not to replace the jobs, but to replace the task. So it can help human finish those uh, unnecessary tasks that uh, take up a lot of time. So we can more focus on doing some creative projects, which is uh, such a good thing for human beings. We don't need to do this repetitive, for example, like a translation. You know, it took me like at least half a year to translate Jordan Peterson's book. I think with uh, chat GPT now, I probably only take one month to do it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then the other five months, you could be focusing on something mm-hmm. else, you know. I could do something else. Exactly. So that that's the, 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 the whole point. I think, you know, sometimes I think we humans, <laughs> we don't challenge ourselves. We're not ambitious with ourselves. We have a very powerful brain. Yes, it does. It, it's limited because usually sequential, only one thought at a time. It's... It, People who have, when I say people who have, are doing two things at the same time, it's not, it's only one at a time. Uh, but I, I look at tools like GPT, you know, it's almost like having a second brain, you know, like, uh, so I'm very, I'm very bullish on, 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 on AI. And, and as you said, I mean, even today, I mean, I, I, I write a lot of, a lot of stuff for either internal or external and even for legal decision making and fiscal decisions, I'm using GPT. Obviously, you know, if there was a lawyer in this conversation, say, oh, but take it easy because, yeah, sure, sure, of course. I mean, of course, obviously. But, but yeah, it does help. It does help uh, be, me be a lot smarter. Yeah, exactly. I see so many Italians move to Portugal in these recent years. So as a local Portuguese, why do you think people pick up Portugal as a destination, especially people working tech and Web3. Yeah, Cam, I, I wish I had, like, uh, yeah, this was part of a grand strategy uh, that was uh, designed 50 yeah. years ago. The answer is no, it just randomly happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it randomly happened. I'm glad it happened. Like, like I'm not saying, oh, just because it's random. No, we're embracing it, mm-hmm. so it's cool. Uh, it does come with some caveats, like, you know, a lot of uh, pressure on local rents for for uh, locals or people who have lower income. So there, there's, there's that. But all in all, I think uh, Portugal, Lisbon in specific, but Portugal in, in general, kind of... Um, it was a combination of factors. So uh, I'll, I'll, I think the rise of um, so we we had this like huge globalization uh, uh, path, right? And and the recent years, since two thousand fifteen, mm. I think we can coin back to fifteen. This kind of uh, was uh, uh, attacked by different forces. Okay, the the positioning of Portugal, uh, together with some events like Web Summit, moving to to Lisbon. All these things compounded, compounded into uh, something much bigger than the country itself, where Lisbon right now is one of the hotspots uh, when it comes to, to tech. And I would say almost like Singapore uh, is for Asia, Lisbon is for Europe when it comes to Web3. Kind of like if you're not in Lisbon and you're working in Web3 or if you're not coming at some point, it's weird. Um, and you're working in Lisbon. At the same time, we we had a lot of people because of Brexit, a lot of yeah. Brits or people were living in the UK. I was one of them. I was in London in 15. I moved to London pre-Brexit. And then I was there during Brexit. And then after Brexit, I was like, first of all, my previous business was around recruitment and, and bringing people uh, to, um, to the UK uh, from the EU. So when Brexit happened, that depleted our, our pipelines completely. 
of, of talent. I mean, it just stopped making sense to business. So we had to adapt. Um, and we adapted by, you know, let's help UK businesses hire, you know, uh, near shore, offshore, like from, from Portugal. And more than near shore, offshore, just be part of the ecosystem. Move there. Move there. So we had a lot of uh, startups that moved to 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 Portugal or created like a a, set, a second satellite. Mm. So for me, like Brexit is another another situation that happened that Portugal didn't plan or anything. Nobody planned, but it helped because a lot of uh, uh, UK um, internationals moved to Portugal. And also the this whole Trump, Biden, all this thing. Also a lot of Americans move move to Portugal. And, and a lot of people also from Brazil. So it, it became this uh, melting, super melting pot where where you just have talent from all over the place. I think you are an example of, of, of that. But there's there's some um, verticals that are more attractive than others. Like And Web3 is one of them. It's it just somehow it, it became a, a beacon of, of, of talent, you know, like a, it's calling talent in just and it's just non-stop yeah. but yeah it all started in my opinion i can coin it back to web summit moving to lisbon and it's just a, a, a snowball effect after that compounded uh, uh, interest and 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 opportunity and it, we are where we are and i think it's it's going to continue i see a lot of people now moving to lisbon staying a few months here and then buying a place 40 45 minutes away from lisbon and this also drives opportunity for those regions which were kind of abandoned or left behind. In this way, they have a new life. So it's very interesting to see this this uh, new new wave of, of income immigration. Very interesting. Yeah. Before I moved to Lisbon, I was in Aveiro for five months. I was doing a music festival. Yeah. It's, a, it's nice to see some uh, outside areas from uh, Lisbon. So you can really see what local Portuguese people are doing and what the local culture there. And you can really feel like, oh, I might belong here or not. Because in Lisbon, I feel like it's more like a multicultural city. For example, just before our recording, we were at a talent brunch and I met uh, two Chinese girls. One was living in Canada, one was living in Germany. They all moved here. I never see so many like Asian immigrants in other European cities, like in the event, especially in tech and uh, female. So I feel like Lisbon is such a multicultural and diverse city. It helps that it's a safe place uh, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Local population is, is calm and uh, it, the culture is, is, is calm as well. Again, we need to pay attention because all these uh, changes can create some sort of uh, backlash. But all in all, I think we have a lot of interesting people moving in. Uh, sometimes they are uh, working to companies abroad, which mm. is fine. Uh, a lot of Portuguese people are working to companies abroad, so it's the same. Uh, but they also move in and set up new businesses and hire people. And, you know, just it's it, again, it's compound. So all in all, I think it has been uh, very beneficial. My only mm. uh, uh, concern beside the backlash or not a concern, but somehow it's a bit painful to to realize that nothing was planned. Maybe the only planning at the beginning was with the Web Summit. <laughs> Uh, you know, that negotiation period with, with uh, Paddy from, from Web Summit mm -hmm. was, was, I think it took a little bit. I don't, I don't remember how that process went. That was kind of planned, but I don't think there was a macro plan. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, I'm, yeah. I'm down with that, but uh, could have been a better. better plan. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your team structure? Because you are very into HR. So when you recruit your team, how it works? And how is the structure? So with, with our team, it's, it's a good question. So when I started Talent Protocol, I had to learn a lot of new things. Um, and when, when I mentioned what's different about Web3, is not only the evolution of internet, but society in general, work as well. And so, <laughs> for instance, it's, it, you can go on my profile on, on Talent Protocol and you can uh, see that I, I want to step down yeah, the from CEO. the CEO role mm -hmm. in, in the next three to four years, right? Until 2015. Hopefully I do a good job or we collectively do a good job, which allows me to, to, to step down. 
it's very weird to to see something like that in 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 you know let's say in a non web tree mm. landscape so, you wouldn't see this mm. naturally or if this would happen it would be very weird i've seen it happen in a lot of places like gitcoin the the the, the founders ex ceo is stepped down where the community took over so what we're doing is essentially a, a centralized process mm -hmm. until we become a decentralized uh, uh, organization so we have a decent uh, a very the decision making the most of the work is being done by by a core team a, core, a team of core contributors and but our roadmap is to eventually become a decentralized uh, autonomous organization so aka giving back power to the community where mm -hmm. they would govern themselves uh, based on 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 token and uh, smart contracts and you know they would be the ones calling the shots because we we don't i mean this is not uh, from night mm -hmm. to day right you take baby steps to get there so we are already doing some of those uh, community votes mm -hmm. like which chain to go to next or um, we have this uh, uh, season KPIs. Can you vote the, the most important to the least important? So those things we, we can do uh, because we have community NFTs and people, even though we haven't launched our token yet, our community token yet, we do have community NFTs called talent mates where people can use them. They represent yeah. their um, membership in the community and we can use that for, for voting. So the way our team works is going from centralized to decentralization but also we're building in public so you can go on our notion you can check the the team calls uh we we try to make it as public as possible open source as well i mean the other day we had uh, a couple pull requests from you know random people just they, uh -huh. they found some some pull yeah. requests just they found the typo but you know it's awesome like uh it's just i think being open is, is awesome uh it it is a trade-off um between uh, uh i think i think there's mm -hmm. there's a mixed trade-off between startup and building a public because as a startup you're always building new things and there's a trade-off with building new things but also making sure mm -hmm. the things you've built are working uh, uh seamlessly but also with building in public there's a third angle which is making yeah. sure that the documentation is all uh, uh on point right and it's a trade-off i don't think you can do all these three right um and I think over time you need to pick, okay, your battles, uh, let's do more of this, let's do less of that. Uh, so it's, mm -hmm. it's always a, a trade-off between these, these three, almost like a trilemma, but not really. Yeah, I see. And how, how did you meet your co-founder? Not just in Web3, but in every startup world, it's very essential to find the right person to work with. So how do you, how's your decision-making process look like when you pick up a co-founder? Yeah. I think I think from I've I've been in the HR tech uh, world for for a long time, and my my previous startup was in uh, tech recruitment, ah, and I, okay. I have to say tech recruitment recruitment in general is is very hard, mm. but when it comes to founders and and founders uh, dating is is probably mm -hmm. the worst uh, type of recruitment because the person you you're uh, quotes getting in bed with is is uh will bring a lot of liability and financial risk to to, to you personally so it, it's a it's a lot of weight on their shoulders on yours i think i think the best the best thing to to do when it comes to to founders dating or, or founder recruitment is um to really understand if they are aligned when it comes to values but also i think it comes with time i mean if you're a first time founder probability of you doing it wrong are very mm -hmm. high um but i think we with time yeah. also you understand uh if that person uh from a work perspective from a values perspective they are aligned with you and also how does that fit in the long run um a lot of people don't don't think about uh things like equity shares and stuff like that uh the, the split equity split uh, uh they only think about the the mm -hmm. moment and what happened in the past but actually equity is a representation of financial and economical representation of potential of, of the company uh, of, or the organization. And mm -hmm. I think it's more important to think about the, the, the future. And a lot of founders, I see a lot of mistakes where they're only thinking, okay, we'll split the company like this because of the mm -hmm. work we've done when the most important thing is, but what's going to happen yeah. next, okay? Who's going to put in? And also because you want people to be incentivized. 
all in all is very complex. So best thing to do is that you create mm. some some or you have some level of trust with these people uh, before. A lot of founders meet at, at school. Okay, at school, university, it's it's very common. Why? Because you've been through the hoops yeah. together, and uh, I mean, just build that trust, initial mm -hmm. trust. And uh, with uh, Philippe, he's my co-founder. We knew each other from from uni, and uh, we always kept in touch. We've done a couple of projects together, which also helped keep not only in in touch but also rebuild and keep building the the trust and when when the time the time came when i was doing my sabbatical i had the idea for talent protocol He's, he was one of the first people that i that i called to to chat about it and the other uh we we had another co-founder uh that is now an advisor that one was introduced to me by by yet another advisor mm. um and but i didn't know him before uh, and uh, the um, Francisco, which, which is the CTO and co-founder uh, yeah. today, he, um, we worked together in my previous startup. So I knew him for, for, a, for a long time and uh, always kept in touch with him and the trust has yeah. been built. So this, my two uh, uh, co-founders right now, they, they are people that I've built trust with before. I think trust takes Completed. time uh it's not from day to day that will happen and um again uh founder dating founder matching is very 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 complex yeah i think i met uh, francisco today because i sported his uh, shirt his talent house hmm. he was wearing that pink shirt finally i met all three of you <laughs> yeah speaking of uh, talent house i was uh, in the first one i think in barcelona such a fun experience because I never got a chance to go to the Web3 conference and I even meet people from Brazil, Russia, so many young talents there. So can you give me a brief introduction about how do you come up with the uh, idea and uh, how the journey goes with a talent house? So it goes back to our mission. So our mission statement is very simple, helping the next generation of builders especially those building or wanting to build in, in Web3, help them achieve success and fulfillment. Now, there's multiple ways to, to get there uh, for this mission. And uh, we've been involved in the Salo ecosystem since the, the right the very beginning of, of, of Town Protocol, uh, because one of our advisors is a big fan and the tech is quite good. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost gasless when you use the, the chains. So it's very easy to use, very easy to build. On top. So, when it came to Barcelona, they were doing their Cello Connect, which is their uh, year event uh, where the Cello community comes together and and builds together and just enjoys themselves together themselves together. And um, I remember, like four, or three or four weeks before, uh, I knew we we obviously gonna go there. Me and Philippe. Um, this was this was right after COVID started to settle down, so I was quite excited to. Okay, finally, proper traveling uh, for conferences. It's it's a thing again. Awesome, let's do this. And uh, and I like we were gonna give a a, a talk at the conference, uh, which was awesome. But other than that, I mean, we're gonna be there. There's a bunch of activities. Uh, we had the, a retreat with one of our investors. Cool. But I, I told Flip, I'm we're missing something. You know, like. Um, <laughs> But there's something missing, you know, like we're not taking advantage of this. It's, it's just, I don't know, something is missing. Think about it, sleep on it, let's talk tomorrow. Good. And then the next day, Philippe comes through with, ah, I had this idea, you know, why don't we, we know, we now have a growing community of talents. Why don't we bring them together to go to their, you know, first hackathon or conference in Web3? And uh, I'm like, that's, that's a great idea. So um, how do we do this? So in long story short, in three weeks, uh, three four weeks we set everything up where we got the partners in um you know cello foundation obviously companies like ari nft fly wallet and others that supported us in this process we did it collectively with other uh startups and communities which was amazing and then we brought a bunch uh, a bright bunch together uh, in um, in Barcelona to live together. Well, we rented an Airbnb. We like a, a, a quite cool one, I guess. Uh, nice location. You were leaving, co-leaving, 
and uh, attending different types of events uh, and understanding more about the, the space. Yeah. I can tell you, like, uh, uh, from, from we, we had someone, she, uh, she was working at Revolut, she moved to Uniswap afterwards, like a, a couple wow. months after she was. And mm -hmm. it has been a life-changing moment uh, for many people, for almost all townhouse alumni. It has been a life-changing moment. Uh, we have this program running all over the world so the next two editions is lisbon paris but i've heard uh istanbul is on the roadmap bangalore a few others africa is also on the on the roadmap for this year and um obviously we have sponsors that allows us to do this uh, protocol labs is one of the sponsors cello foundation is another and um and yeah i'm very very happy about the town halls uh, because people like you get the chance to like high potential talent they, they get the chance to go to where the opportunity is learn from it learn from other people meet other people you know and, and then the opportunities just uh just uh, appear and it's, it's amazing it's a bullseye in our mission it's definitely a bullseye. It just makes sense. We're now trying to understand, like, from a gamification and, and a protocol perspective, how that fits in. But, I mean, we're doing it with time. Uh, building a product is not a one-off thing. It's an ongoing thing. So we're taking our time and, and just researching and doing the, the, the things that we're thinking uh, the right way, hopefully. So if people want to be participate in this, they can check out your website. I'll, I'll include yeah. the link yeah, so they can apply. Maybe I'll see them in yeah. ETHCC in Paris. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be there, so looking forward. Cool, yeah. You know, in Web3 world, there is a lot of uh, ups and downs, especially downs <laughs> <laughs> last year. So how did you cope it? Have you ever like have the thought to give up or, or facing some tough decisions, especially in the not good year? Um, so I'm, I'm a builder at art. So um, what attracted mm -hmm. me to the Web3 space was not the trading component. Okay? I do understand that for many years, Trading was the only utility that you would have, and stable coins appeared. So that more and more utility started to to appear, right? And um, but for a while there, it was only uh, trading, uh, which is uh, is fine. It's still an activity, right? And uh, obviously, I don't see the world in black and white. Just you can be a builder, but also have your own portfolio. And, trade on the side whatever it will do whatever works for you so i'm not innocuous to to market swings obviously they do affect uh, but i try to just keep focusing on on my uh, purpose what i'm building uh, our community just making sure we, we're going in the right place uh, obviously uh, uh talking about market swings uh I do have, like, I always say the, the number one uh, priority of a CEO is to make sure there's money, right? If there's no money, there's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing to do. Uh, you're sure. gone. Keep you're... the company running. Yeah. Exactly. So number one, like, obviously, a CEO has other priorities. But I would say, like, without money, there's there's no other priorities. They don't even think about it. So it's almost guaranteeing the, 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 the present in order to guarantee the future. And... Uh, so basically, uh, when all these things happen, I had to keep an eye open on, on this and protect our community treasury. So that's part of my job. Mm -hmm. I think I've done a good job at it. We were able to to safe keep our treasury, uh, especially when it came to the lunar crash. You know, call it uh, part luck, part wisdom, whatever it was, we, we were able to, to safe keep our treasury um during those those uh rough times mm. but also it was uh, tough because we had to make some some team decisions some community decisions on um i mean we had to change our plans uh when when the the, the market turned from a bull to a bear market we had to to adapt our plans i mean uh, mm. uh, same thing with a, a company that is launching on a stock market the ipo date uh, it's very important. Uh, same thing when SpaceX, I'm just using another dumb example, but SpaceX, when they launched a rocket to the space, I mean, they got to pick the day right, depending on weather conditions. So it's not only about the rockets, about other things as well. So it, we, you, we're not living in a, a, a lab, we're living in the real world. So the, the real world will, mm -hmm. will affect you. So as a CEO, you got to keep an eye open or the two eyes open and, and make sure they protect your, your community. 
in, in your treasury. So that's that's what I, I've been doing uh, so far. And um, and yeah, here we are. Yeah. So what's your vision for the future of Talent Protocol? I think like uh, our, our vision. So first of all, we're still like a pre-product market fit. I'm, mm-hmm. I think like in terms of North Star for, for product vision, I see uh, a world where um, we can definitely measure, help talent measure their success and fulfillment through accountability, but also through competition, which is something we mm-hmm. haven't been working on, the competition part. I think humans thrive when mm-hmm. they're competing. Um, and I think this, this we need to work on these two components to drive talent forward. Um, I see, well, in terms of product vision, I see a, a, a gamified, uh, based on these two components, accountability and, and competition, a gamified mm-hmm. experience, experience platform experience that allows um, anyone to build their products or, well, it doesn't have to be a product, it can be music, it can be uh, writing, it can be anything, mm-hmm. um, any creator or builder to just move forward with their career goals. So that's where I see us mm-hmm. going. Uh, right now you can do career updates on the platform. That's going super well. It's, it's almost like a viral loop where mm-hmm. people update others and then others update others people just almost like uh, accountability buddies uh, <laughs> of each other very interesting to see yeah. that in, in in real time which is a rich recent feature we, we we've launched and uh so i'm very bullish on accountability and um competition when it comes to to our uh product vision how we will build this future will tell uh we keep mm-hmm. learning from our community we keep uh, experimenting as well but again, I'm very bullish. I think we, we are on the right path. We, we keep having talent just organically talking about us, organically um, joining the platform. And it's, it's, it's been, it's been uh, an amazing, because Talent Protocol is only two years old. And it's, these two years have been uh, crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah. Let's see what the next two hold. Yeah, what impressed me most is you keep launching new features and... Uh, yeah, it's like a very vivid child, <laughs> well, say, talent protocol. There's so many new things. Every time I see new feature, oh, I want to try. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just keep it alive, but which is good. It's good, but it's also, again, a trade-off with um, making sure what you've built. So it's, it's I, I would say just so people, like, especially new uh, first-time founders don't, don't uh, you know, um, get ahead of themselves, which is, I mean, you got to keep, you know launching otherwise you're dead in the water but um it, it, it's the right balance between uh launching new things but experimenting with them looking at them as experiments and being mm. okay with killing legacy i think a lot of startups die because you're too hooked on the things you've built and the second part is uh not only focusing on the things you've built making sure that the ones that uh, things you built but making sure the, the ones you've built already are working seamlessly and um again it's very hard to do it and if you had if you add as i said before the the building public part then it becomes a, a nightmare a living nightmare but um but yeah, all in all i uh, appreciate your words uh we keep doing our best some of the things we've shipped uh, didn't work uh we do a lot of postmortems um a lot i mean i've never been in an organization that does this amount of postmortem <laughs> it's almost like we, we're killing bodies all the time and doing postmortems on, on the bodies but it's 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 good i mean we're learning from from that process and documenting that those learnings um so so that when we do it next yeah. we, we can do better so so yeah let's see let's see where these two years uh the, the next two years take us but in the meantime we keep helping talent uh gain self-confidence be more visible be more accountable be more competitive drive drive their goals forward so i think um we're definitely helping uh, a lot of people and that's that's yeah, going back to my purpose, uh, uh, bullseye on my purpose, on my personal purpose. Yeah. So what do you think the biggest different differ you from the traditional professional network platform like LinkedIn? Yeah, I think I think uh, LinkedIn, um, we, by the way, we have a great relationship with LinkedIn uh, innovation team. They, they have 
obviously they're looking into Web3. Probably they're now more focused on AI, uh, but they were a lot of fo- they had a lot of focus on 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 Web3 some time ago. But I think like uh, from an experiment uh, experiment uh, point of view, uh, our platform is future thinking. It's accountability thinking. Theirs is more like about present and past. Um, they built the recruitment machine basically so uh you're the data they're monetizing your data for uh recruitment uh, uh, any company that needs recruitment they, they they use linkedin which is great i mean it's great business uh we we don't have a recruitment angle uh on talent protocol like obviously we know uh, a lot of talent and and a lot of you know a lot of people are either looking for jobs or hiring um we do we do like i think the plan there is to have some some partnerships um and linkedin could be a partner um to to help with that okay because we don't want to focus on on that component on the recruitment uh, uh recruitment is uh is quite hard and low margins and, and it's very hard to do it right i mean no one has been able to nail recruitment um 100 it's very hard because it involves humans analyzing other humans and that makes things very very complex and i think ai if ai solves that i mean well, then i would say okay maybe we'll be out of jobs uh all of us because that problem right there like that would be that would be fascinating to 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 watch maybe we're closer than than i think uh, which is great. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So apart from a talent protocol, you are also part of uh, D Night, like a event platform to connect with the local Portuguese Web three projects and people. So, can you tell me more about uh, this one? Like, how do yeah. you come up with that with this idea and uh, how it works? So, actually, it's very good pre- prelude to. What I want to do with with Talent Protocol uh, about my own role because on on D nights I was part of the leadership team until uh, early this year, uh, but then I stepped down because my my role was done pretty much. So with I'm still a member of the of D nights proud member, um, got my NFT membership card <laughs> and uh, basically D D nights started out as what we were talking before with Portugal being so attractive to everyone and every organization and, and Lisbon in specific. And when it came to Web3, it was this times uh, 10. Uh, and uh, we were like, damn, you know, all these events happening in Lisbon, this was like two years ago, uh, all these events happening in Lisbon, if Lisbon, Solana, uh, uh, you know, checkpoints, uh, and mm. all, all these events happening at mm-hmm. the same time. We're like, damn, it's like, uh, let's do something during this this period of time but do it differently yeah uh join the local startups and and just do events to you know onboard people into web tree and just chill together and we came up with this concept of d nights decentralized nights um where we would have like uh, from 7 to 11 7 p.m to 11 p.m uh would have uh, um we would host events and would have everyone chipping in uh, some money. So, and we did it. The, the first year, two years ago, was, uh, I mean, the, the, there was a, the leadership team was organizing everything. Everybody chipped in. Uh, it was amazing. I mean, uh, uh, to to see the the community come together mm-hmm. like that. After that, we were like, well, mm-hmm. what if this was more like a, a DAO where D Knight DAO would fund would fund decentralized would fund communities uh who want to organize uh web3 events and that's what we did so my main job as part of the leadership team there was uh, fundraising so i fundraised uh i fundraised over 100k for the DAO, mm. um which supported a lot of events during the 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 next one year a year and a half and um and then when like we did a bunch of them in, in lisbon porto madeira Braga, so all over Portugal. Mm-hmm. And then when that was done, uh, mm-hmm. I was like, I, I talked to the other leadership uh, uh, members. I said, I think my job is done here. Like, uh, uh, that's where I'm strong. Yeah. And I, I want to give the, the room to someone else to take over. Paulo, uh, which has been in Dallas for a long time, Paul Fonseca, he, 
he accepted the challenge. Uh, but eventually the DAO needs mm. to uh, evolve in terms of governance. So we can have like voting on the leadership team or something like that. Uh, funding, you know, like it, it needs to become more of a DAO. But uh, when I say more of a DAO, it means it needs to become more decentralized and more autonomous yeah. as an organization from all perspectives, autonomous financially, autonomous uh, from governance models uh, in, in, in many different ways. But uh, all in all, it's been amazing. We've brought uh, thousands of people together, uh, people who didn't know anything about Web3. They're like, oh, this is actually cool. They even do parties, you know, like, well, nice. Um, mm -hmm. It's just such a... Party like a local. Exactly. And so <laughs> such a chill environment where you're like, you don't even feel the pressure. You're not going to a workshop or anything. Maybe sometimes we did a panel before <laughs> or something like that. Just if that's, yeah. if you really want to go a bit deeper, maybe you can have like some, some learning uh, components before. But uh, yeah, we started to test different things as well. Sometimes we would have a co-work day followed by a party. So it's just a chill environment, get people to to make real connections and, and get into Web3. And, and yeah, I think I think we, we, we were able to to deliver that. So you can go on dnights.com mm -hmm. and, and, and check it out. Yeah, and it's also good for newcomers like me. So I can meet a lot of the local people and learn some Web3 knowledge as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's your advice for young people who want to step into the Web3 world? What's your big three advices for them? Uh, you know, step one is uh, set up an account on Talent Protocol. <laughs> start building your network of supporters, start to to build up that self-accountability. I think Talent Protocol is, is creating a nice experiment for, for that, okay? Uh, second of all, don't, don't be afraid to apply for, mm -hmm. for multiple grants that exist uh, out there. Uh, and third, uh, to, to go on, mm -hmm. on events and hackathons and just get building. Uh, don't worry about too much about what you're building, just ship it, just show it. The more you show to more people, the better it is. Even if it's mm -hmm. uh, part of my French, even if it's shit, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you you just the fact that you're putting out there, exposing yourself is is 100 x more than many other people. So um, I hopefully that becomes the standard. Uh, and uh, and and yeah, so I think those three things uh, would be um, more than sufficient to you know ambitious uh undiscovered talent to to just resurface to surface and and, and get noticed yeah because you mentioned that you probably will switch to ed education tech in the future yeah <laughs> that's so, that's my next pet. yeah so so how will you prepare this journey and what gets you most excited about this space I think I think education has always been around the corner for me. Like uh, being in HR mm. tech, it's always there. It's that thing that it always connects. Whether it's recruitment, whether it's what we're building on talent protocol with all this belief economy, belief economy around talent, it's always there. You know, it's always been there. Now I'm a father, and I think this kind of changes things a little bit. At least it brings more skin in the game for me. And um, I started. Just exploring the, the educational uh, tooling, solutions out there. There's very interesting stuff being built, right? And um, what I want to do, you know, uh, post-town protocol is just take some time off, do a sabbatical. Mm. And this sabbatical will probably be focused on, you know, a um, couple of technologies, whatever it is, then in two, three years' time. Just go deep. Uh but also is um, focusing on a vertical perspective on this edu tech, so ed tech um, uh, component. Mm. So it's kind of the crossing between whatever technology I think uh, is fundamentally uh, fundamental for me to to learn on a deeper level, but also um, going deeper in this vertical. I think uh, the sabbatical I did before was quite successful. Uh, in the sense that mm. I started something new. I allowed myself to go on diffuse mode. So I want to do the same again. Allow myself to go on diffuse mode, hopefully more than three months this time. Just learn about the field and then go go yeah. in. I think it can. I've, I've seen a lot of solutions. I think I can execute better some of the things. Some of the things I love, I think maybe I can execute better. But I want to give me the space, the mind space to learn. 
and I want to give, uh, uh, you know, I just can give me, it's not like uh, I didn't work my ass off, like I worked mm-hmm. my ass off for this. Yeah. I give my, myself the opportunity to go into diffuse mode, learn, but having this focus in, in mind. So that's where it's coming from, uh, the, the, the going into this uh, space. Which is HR tech. I look at it as HR tech as well. It's not the same, but it's it's in the field of you know helping people find their purpose. I mean, working with kids is very interesting. Very very interesting. That they they're in the transformational uh, moments of of their their lives and their their brains are developing. So it's it's ripe for uh, um, you know helping them uh, educate themselves. I I, I don't want to go into how to do it i have a lot of ideas every day i just want to take time learn and then go at it again yeah okay last question you mentioned your father now so what's one big lesson you want to pass on to your child <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that's that's uh that's a good question um i have i i whenever i i get a, a question in in this context um I have this this uh, uh, tile at home. But, you know, Portuguese thing, especially in Lisbon, you have the the buildings with tiles. Oh yeah, um, yes, tiles. And yeah. you paint the tiles uh-huh. and stuff like that. So I have one at home because you have these these phrases, right? You write on the top. Oh, so one okay. of the phrases that I have there to remind me. So it's not it's not like I wake up every day. I look at the phrase. <laughs> yeah. It's not that, but it's there. It's there. It's an important thing for me. It it represents a belief and the belief is that uh life is hard if you're soft so mm. i think that's the biggest thing i want to pass to my 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 you know uh, my legacy is life is hard if you're soft so um try not to be soft at most of the times um try to make your life easier in yes. essence <laughs> by not not being uh, uh, soft you know This can have multiple meanings. I think for me as a meaning, uh, for my kids mm-hmm. will have a different meaning. Whatever the meaning is, uh, the fundamental thing is, if you don't know anything about it, it yeah. definitely will get harder for you. Thanks for okay. sharing that. And uh, thank you for very much for your time. I'll see you soon. <laughs> All right, cheers. Thank you so much, Cam.